Okay, good afternoon and welcome to this session in the Challenging Conversations panel series that we run from Maudsley Simulation Learning Programs. My name is Geraldine Strathdee, and just to describe to uh, people uh, what the purpose of this uh, Challenging Conversation series is, we set out to create a safe space where people working in the field of mental health in its broader sense, uh, people accessing services there, people who've used mental health services and have gone on to do other things, could have a space where they could talk together about what other challenges, what, what do we need to debate and discuss about the model of treatment, about the model of mental health in the country. We have lots of opportunities in, in many other forums to debate specific things, but we wanted this to be a place where young clinicians, young professionals, experts by experience, their families could actually come together and talk about real issues and feel safe to do that. And we very much welcome this uh, from the Maudsley. So today's series is another very interesting one in our series. We've debated white privilege and people overrepresentation of people from BAME communities in the use of the mental health in this series. We've debated, should we still be doing restrictive practice in the 21st century in this series? We've debated the use of medication. We've debated recovery and the, are we listening enough to the voice of people who lived experience? Today, our question is, is there a general understanding that there is life living with and life after mental illness? What are we who work in the field doing to publicize that absolute drive that we need to have? Why are so many of the messages that we see in the newspapers coming from people new to this world of mental health? Do we, what's the reason we don't speak out enough What's the reason that we still have enormous variation in the types of treatments, safe and effective, that people have across the country? Why aren't we hearing more from people with lived experience who've gone on to lead lives that have been what they wanted and that are fulfilling? <clears throat> so I'm joined today by an absolutely fantastic broad range of experienced people. And I'm going to ask each panel member to introduce themselves and what their perspective is on those questions. Is, do, does the world understand there is life living with and living after mental illness? Has the pendulum swung too far that people talk about mental well-being? So I'm going to start with no one better place than Richard Vincent from the School of Life. Richard, could you take us off uh, yes, yes. Can you hear me? And uh, is everything working? Great. OK, well, thank you so much for inviting um, uh, the School of Life and um, who I'm sort of representing to participate today. Um, uh, I've got a great deal of admiration for the Morsley, so um, I, I'm um, excited to be here. Um, just to sort of locate me and the School of Life, um, uh, for those of you who, who are not familiar with it, um, it's a, a, an organisation that was set up about 15 years ago or so um, by uh, a philosopher called um, Alain de Paton, among other people. Um, and the, the general aim of the organisation is to try and help people live more fulfilling lives. Um, it's got a number of ways of reaching people. Um, we have a, a YouTube channel, which might be the way most of you are familiar with it, if you see some... Uh, two or three minutes sort of cartoon about Melanie Klein or something, um, then it's quite likely it's come from the School of Life. And that's very um, popular. But we also have workshops, uh, we write books. Um, and um, uh, where I come in is um, uh, as the clinical lead of the psychotherapy team. Um, I'm a counselling psychologist by training, but um, we lead a sort of diverse group um, seeing clients online. So that's a little bit about where I'm coming from. Um, as far as the question is concerned, I think, broadly speaking, the School of Life, um, uh, I think it believes really that um, for various sort of historical societal reasons that um, uh, we've already developed quite unrealistic expectations of life. Um, there is a good deal of suffering, um, even in the best of our lives. 
Um, and I think the simple acknowledgement of that fact is quite um, is quite inclusive. Um, of course, people who are having experiencing severe and um, enduring sort of mental illness um, might be struggling more and having functioning, but rather than there being a sort of binary division between being well and ill, um, it's more of a sort of scale. Um, uh, most of us are ill at some point uh, and um, uh, at various times it can be quite severe even in the most functional uh, situation. So I suppose that's one point which seems quite sort of pessimistic and bleak um, but it's actually quite normalising and quite inclusive and is something that's quite fundamental at the School of Life I think. Um, we're not completely naive of course there have to be criteria for accepting people into to services um, but we'd probably say that it's not particularly helpful um, if it's held too tightly um, and that it's sort of better to sort of um, try and uh, not emphasize too much the, 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 um, the boundary between being ill and well. Um, let's see, what else was I going to say? I think um, the combination of uh, lots of the messages that the School of Life um, give out. Um, for me as a clinician, um, it contributes to most clients who come in um, are relatively enthusiastic about the prospect of beginning therapy. Um, that's very different to the experience I experienced in public health. Um, uh, of course, people's functioning might be slightly different, but there's a sort of tone, um, not a kind of West Coast sort of, unre I don't want to stereotype the West Coast at all, but not a sort of unrealistic kind of happiness seeking, um, but something about uh, that fulfillment can be achieved in one way or another um, that, that, that fits us all. Um, I'm conscious of that I don't want to speak for too long. So um, I guess the other things, um, uh, yeah, I think that um, uh, even though we're a private organization and um, uh, a private psychotherapy service, I think um, uh, we do have uh, clients who have you know, severe and enduring um, difficult lives. Um, and I think there are definitely some avenues, things like um, bereavement or um, long-term illness, um, where meaning and fulfillment is considered you know, as a matter of course. And there are other things like panic attacks or psychosis, uh, where it seems to get moved to the side a little bit, uh, addiction is another one. Um, and we get quite a lot of clients who um, come specifically because they want to talk about meaning alongside this. Um, I think the, as, as clinicians, I suppose, um, uh, we do encourage people to live fulfilled lives, um, but we're quite careful about what that actually looks like. Um, some people want a relationship, some people don't. Some people want a relationship with one person, some people want a relationship with lots of people. Um, uh, likewise with employment, what people do with their time, with exercise, what they eat. Um, so I suppose um, uh, fulfilling, life, uh, fulfilling life in principle, yes, but in terms of what constitutes that, I think it, it probably needs to be very much seen through the eyes of a, a, a client or a, a person. Um, I was just going to say one other thing, um, really as an observation, not, not something that I'm taking personal responsibility for really, but um, some of the things that the School of Life does well, I think, um, it has quite an inclusive, normalising tone of voice. Um, and I think that's something that individually, clinicians I think generally do, um, but I think as organisations, I don't think we always do which can sometimes be a bit preachy and a little bit sort of, um, what's the word, sort of um, excluding rather than including. Um, Thank you, Richard. Yes. What I've taken from what you've said is that, first of all, I love the name the School of Life, but what I'm taking from that is that people feel positive about coming. So there's something in the way that you publicize what you do that makes people feel they're not coming, as you say, expecting ecstatic happiness, but they are coming because you're creating that sense of positivity and helping people think about fulfilling lives. So that's, and that um, therapeutic hope that you offer, 
that's often a criticism of statutory mental health services is that we don't offer that sense of hope and optimism and, and kind of respect for what people want to lead fulfilling lives. So if I can turn next to our second panel member, Zoe Clare. Zoe, you, you are someone with lived experience um, in many, many ways. And I would love to, we would love to hear your story. And um, thank you very, very much indeed for having the courage to come and share it with us and for becoming a Maudsley Learning Digital Fellow, despite being in a completely different trust. So <laughs> please do tell us your story and the, the, the messages you want to get across from that. Absolutely. Thank you, Geraldine. Um, so I guess where I'm coming from is I do have lived experience of what we would call severe and enduring mental illness um, over 20 years with. Um, but I am also, I do have an undergraduate degree in psychology. Um, more recently, I've got a master's in mental health nursing. I work as a mental health nurse. And I also work as an assistant psychologist. Um, and I've just applied for a PhD. So I guess where I come from is, do I think that there is a life with, can you live a life with severe mental enduring illness? Absolutely. And um, my personal sort of journey on that has been really, really challenging. Um, and I guess what the barriers to that, and currently still are the barriers to that, I think comes down to that uh, still, unfortunately, that sense of stigma and that sense of what we see as textbook cases in terms of, you know, people are given a label, a diagnosis, this is what that means for them, rather than looking at necessarily what the individual um, wants to achieve, can achieve, and um, aspires to achieve. Um, certainly, um, within my own personal experience, you know, as a, as a teenager, a psychiatrist said to me, you know, Zoe, you won't be anything unless you have your piece of paper, unless you have your A-levels, unless you have, you know, you will just work in a shop. You, that's all that you will be with this, with this diagnosis. Um, and I think that's quite hard to hear yeah. <laughs> as a teenager and also with someone who's actually struggling with quite difficult things um, as well as just being a teenager. Um, and, you know, kind of going forward, and yes, I have achieved things and I have battled, I would say, to be heard and, and to get on degree programmes. But then working, I think, then as a mental health nurse has then added another layer of complexity because actually, you know, what can we change when we're asking that question? I've worked with colleagues uh, during my nurse employment. I've been asked to, you know, leave meetings because my I do have scars on my arm, so that's inappropriate. You can't work as a mental health nurse with scars on your arms, or you're going to influence the patients. What are the patients going to think? The patients going to copy you, and so for me, it's very much around. We are still in this place. We talk about mental well-being. That's great, and that seems to be a norm now and we seem to accept that um, from a society point of view, but we aren't talking about mental illness. Um, and, you know, to have those experiences and to still turn up every day, you know, we need more people who are, you know, supported to do that and whatever that may be. I mean, I wanted to work in mental health, but whatever career they may be, and um, where those things aren't stigmatized. Um, and, you know, I was in a meeting the other day and they mentioned a CEO of a, another NHS trust and the fact that he lives with bipolar disorder. And it struck me that, you know, you know, that's, that's admirable, but would we be talking about that if he had a physical illness? Would we be talking about his physical illness as, as, as a CEO? Would we, be doing, would we be talking about the work that he'd done and the changes and the inspirations that he'd made for his patient group? Um, so I guess why we're not promoting life and what needs to change, I think that, you know, and I'll include myself in that as a mental health professional, I think we need to change the narrative in terms of society, but I think we also need to change the narrative in terms of the, the work that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think there is still a lot of work to be done. And I think that we need to support people to do whatever they 
want to do, but also to support people with mental illness who also want to work in the profession of mental health. Um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from, Geraldine, if that that's absolutely wonderful thank you so much indeed Zoe and I full of admiration for you sharing that and for the incredible courage it must take day in and day out and year in year out to to kind of make such a success of of your chosen career and if I can and I liked your parting words of society needs to change and inside the services need to change so if I can perhaps just come on to Rob, kind of quoting Rob, I mean, um, Professor Robin Murray is one of our kind of colleagues at SLAM. He chaired the Schizophrenia Commission way back um, and in an organisation that is now called Rethink Mental Illness. And one of the, star- uh, to me, probably one of the most startling conclusions of that commission, which is a couple of decades back, was that the greatest therapeutic nihilism, the greatest sense of no hope or no optimism about people recovering or being able to lead fulfilling lives for people with mental illness and particularly severe mental illness was coming from inside the professional groups. So Rob, you're someone, and I'll let you introduce yourself, who's taking both an approach about how can you get a whole population understand for a whole population in a very deprived area? How can you understand the mental health patterns then and how to actually help at every level? But you're also someone who's kind of leading a whole clinical pathway for people with psychosis. So, and you're an anthropologist by background, which I do think is really kind of important in, in, in the way that you describe things. So what's your perspective on this? Well, first, thanks, Geraldine. First, thanks to Zoe and Richard for um, framing this a little bit. I mean, I think I agree with both of you. Um, I mean, I think, Richard, you're right that um, there is a spectrum of suffering and we're all human and we all suffer. And and that really needs to be remembered as a sort of starting point, I think, um, in mental health. And and Zoe, I think it, it's extraordinary, you know, what, what you've achieved clearly. Um, and and you pointed to both the importance of not limiting our aspirations for people who may fall into this group of people we see as patients, but also thinking about the patient in ourselves and what it means to be um, um you, you know, given what Richard says that we all suffer, to, you know, ourselves as human beings, so we all have mental health, you know. Um, how do we ensure that we that we're inclusive and that we bring all that richness to um, to the delivery of mental health services? And I suppose I feel, um, Geraldine said I studied anthropology. I mean, I think you know within psychiatry there's always been these two frames of reference. One which has been quite sort of reductive and thinking about syndromes and definitions, and um, the other which has been more around dimensions and thinking about how we all share. Uh, um, qualities and and suffer more or less in certain domains and I think both of these approaches are equally important actually because without the first it's impossible really for um, particularly psychiatry to have any science at all or any way of distinguishing one thing from another Um, and also in terms of a public health system like the NHS to try and determine um, how many people in this particular area of the country suffer in, in, in in this particular way um, you know, Richard was talking about addictions or about psychoses or about depression or whatever, what panic disorder, I think you said, but whatever it might be, it's important for the system to have some sense of where particular problems congregate so that then we can think about what to do about it. And that may not be delivery of, uh, of, 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 of health care. It might be um, around prevention. It might be social causes of uh, a certain uh, disorders. So maybe the politics around that, it might be around, um, can we intervene earlier? You know, particularly using some of the sort, sort of more um, psychological therapies that we're talking about. But it may be about acknowledging that there are certain groups. And as Geraldine said, I've been working a bit on this with um, uh, some of the uh, scientists in the IPPN around um, if one can identify particular groups that have um, established uh, um, serious mental illness, that we do not neglect those groups and that we do offer um, an equitable um, service to the whole population affected so that there aren't these sort of large scale variations that we 
often see between one uh, part of a borough or one part of uh, the country and another. And that, um, and that we're also honest, that we have a sense of whether we're achieving any um, clinical outcomes of benefit when we, uh, you know, when, when, we're, when we use whatever interventions we have. I mean, I think something that has changed a lot since I was in psychiatry and I've been in psychiatry since sort of 2001, definitely at that point, there was an us and them kind of attitude without a doubt. And, um, and also there was a sense, I think, of overwhelm that the system could not, at least in South London, that the system didn't have enough resources for what it was being asked to do. And I think after a period where a lot of people who are very vulnerable were discharged from the system, I think quite counterproductively, though with good intent, because it was under the banner of recovery, I think there has been much more thinking in the NHS and within the Department of Health and within just thinking about public policy about um, how we work as a whole system beyond healthcare, how we involve social care, how we involve the voluntary sector, how we participate and co-produce things with service users and carers and communities. What does it mean for someone? And I think that's where it comes more to this, this dimensions of illness and what it means to live a meaningful life. Because then I think if the whole system is beginning to think, and I, I think one can at least be hopeful that this is the right direction of travel, whether we achieve it is another matter. And that's why I think we have to be honest about outcomes. But if we have got that policy direction right, it holds out the prospect of saying, OK, well, we can say that in this particular place, there are these particular problems that are affecting these people. But in our aspirations and in the way that we work, uh, together, acknowledging that we're part of that community ourselves, that we are, you know, the sky's the limit. So we can think about um, um, th things like education. We can think about employment. We can think about uh, what it li means to live a meaningful life in the round, relationships, you know, um, even the quality of uh, the environment people are living in. You know, um, so I think that conversation, I feel, has completely shifted. And I mean, I work in Lambeth as part of the Lambeth Alliance, which is one of the national vanguards in this area. And it's been really quite uplifting to, to work as part of this. And we have service users and carers embedded within that. We work with the council. We work with the voluntary sector. So, um, you know, will we achieve what we hope to achieve? I don't know. But do we have the right policy direction? I hope so. Can we resource it? Well, that's a question. Uh, Rob, thank you for absolutely giving hope and optimism. That was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, just because it is so great to, to, to hear your 20 years perspective. Um, and I think what I'll do now is come on to Ali, uh, Alison Brabham, who is, a like me, has been an absolute campaigner for... Um, Better, better mental health care, recovery-based mental health care for probably more than two decades. And Alice, and she, we share a similar frustration, which is why have we still got, after all these years, 2002 was the very first NICE mental health guideline, which was about biopsychosocial, offering people social, psychological medication if they needed it, recovery outcomes. Why? given that that started in 2002, are we still all these years later, if you look at the national clinical audits, why have we got such incredible variation? And people don't know when they go into a service, what actually can they expect to get that, that's based on guidelines? Um, I'll just say my usual thing, which is if we were talking about cancer, if we were kind of in the healthcare part of the system that talked about cancer and we were being told, or we were understanding that, in some parts of the country, although the, the right treatment was maybe three different chemotherapy medications and some radiotherapy and potentially surgery. And if we were told, well, in your part of the country, you can only offer people one of those chemotherapy medications, we would be jumping up and down. There would be a class action suit. There would be insurance companies jumping on this bandwagon. And we've got that level of variation in, the, in people being able to access evidence-based interventions in England, how can we make, how are we not jumping up and down about it? So Ali, you'll have a much more calm psychologically, psychological view than me on this. What, what's your kind of response to this? Thanks very much, Geraldine. Uh, just to introduce myself. So yeah, I'm Ali and um, I'm a clinical psychologist by background. I have spent 
34 years working with severe mental health problems and I'm still get very frustrated with where we're at in terms of mental health care delivery. So I, I've just been reflecting in terms of the question and, and kind of I'm hoping I'll bring in enough kind of thoughts about what, what's going wrong. But I go back to when I very first trained as a clinical psychologist and, you know, I was given some very clear and probably erroneous, very erroneous messages about severe mental health problems back then. So one of the things we were taught was that people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia don't recover. And, um, you know, that that really kind of impacted not just on me, but I was very aware then when I qualified how that was impacting on practice generally. And I remember because I kind of was questioning it even back then because it just didn't kind of meet my expectations of people I'd met. I was very involved with the hearing voices kind of movement at the time and was meeting people who, you know, experienced voices, had been given diagnoses of schizophrenia and yet were getting on with their lives, had, you know, very meaningful, satisfying lives and yet were hearing voices. Um, and I remember taking, you know, some kind of recordings of some of the people telling their stories to the clinical team I was working with at the time. And they were a very good team showing these videos and saying, what do you think? You know, it looks like that person's recovered. And I'm saying, well, they've obviously got the diagnosis wrong. Um, and then, I mean, much later, we're probably talking about a decade later, even perhaps more, listening to you know, Dr. Eleanor Longdon talking about her story. She's a kind of service user researcher at Manchester University. And she talks about, you know, when she was diagnosed with schizophrenia, uh, she was told, you know, it would have been better to have been diagnosed with cancer because at least, you know, then there was a chance of recovery. There wasn't if she had schizophrenia. And I mean, these are heartbreaking stories. Uh, and I've got to say they're not rare. And here we are, we're, we're in the 21st century. And so how far have we got? And I've got to say, I think there are some examples of where we've moved a long way. So one of the things in my kind of passion to really change services, I was responsible for setting up an early intervention service in the northeast of England. And what I saw there was uh, a real kind of change in culture in what was delivered. So the staff believed that people could get their lives back there was you know, access to a range of evidence-based interventions. And also, you know, we focused on needs and not symptoms. And what we saw was people recovering. And I think then, then what happened was that, to be honest, I think the staff were quite amazed as well, because I, I've got to say, I, did, I was kind of leading the service and I cherry picked who I got into that service. And there was a culture that we were gonna make a difference. And then we started collecting outcomes and saw the difference we were making. You know, very, very few people, it was a minority, about 30% of people after three years were actually going further into services in terms of secondary care. A lot of people going back to primary care and not needing mental health care. And people couldn't believe it. They were looking at the figures and just, you know, what is going on here? These can't be the traditional patients, but these, you know, we were taking everyone who was coming through with the first episode of psychosis. So it can happen in mental health services. We can make a difference. We can get staff on board, but it's interesting now because if you look at what's happening, I think that early interventions, they've been services have been described as the kind of jewel in the crown of mental health services. And I think that what we don't see is that practice happening generally across all of secondary care. I think that the community mental health transformation and the policy that we have now really has a kind of and gives us an opportunity to make some huge, enormous transformational changes. But a lot has to happen. And my view about why it's not happening. I have a lot of thoughts about this. One is definitely there is something about ex that exposure to kind of people's stories, meeting people who've recovered. Um, and also in relation to psychological therapies, this is, you know, I go on ad nauseum about the fact people need to have access. When you hear people talking about the difference psychological therapies can make, and that includes families talking about family intervention, it's that hearts and minds. It, it's not just sometimes nice guidelines isn't enough. We have to hear and, and actually ex have that kind of experience of knowing what a difference and what's important to people. One, that's one thing. That's absolutely essential to a culture shift that needs to take place in services. 
And part of that culture shift is really good leadership as well. And strong leadership uh, with people who really do believe in recovery, who are basically confident enough to take risks and to challenge the system. And that takes some guts at times, because sometimes you're going to have to kind of go up against your colleagues. You're going to have to challenge the system and challenge the status quo. There's a whole host of other kind of infrastructure issues in terms of supporting a more recovery focused service as well. So we need to have the whole range of opportunities. We need to be acknowledging social determinants and giving people access, you know, when we're thinking about addressing people's problems, thinking about social needs as well as addressing symptoms. And as I say, <laughs> psychological therapies, you know, I sometimes feel like they're the bits that always get missed out. So even in the community transformation, you know, Yes, it's fantastic. We need to make sure people have got access to a whole range of different opportunities. But if someone's feeling so anxious that they can't leave the house or their self-confidence is so diabolical that you know they, they just dare to go and meet other people, then sometimes people, we need a bit of therapy to help people to actually get out and you know get to those assets. We need everything. This really is about recognising that broad range of biopsychosocial needs and us working together as a system to address them. As always, Ali, you speak absolute, total and utter sense. And uh, let's hope in the next two decades, these wonderful younger leaders on this call can kind of really make it happen. Adam, I'm going to come to you last, but definitely not least. I'm so grateful to you for kind of coming along to share your story as well. So you see the title, tell us what your perspective is. So, yeah, for me, uh, it was cannabis that was the, 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 the sort of focus of the reason, really, why I, I had any mental health problems in the first place. I took a gap year to Canada and over there, in, even in 95, I didn't realise they had that reputation for, like, enjoying their weed. So I came back to England after that, trying to do a, a psychology degree course. I realised I didn't have an A-level in psychology and I, I couldn't really keep my, my thoughts ordered as it was. So it, my, my mental health declined and declined to 99. I you know, we ended up in hospital, uh, in and out of hospital, where, like over those years between 99 and 2010, because I was like psycho psychologically addicted to the cannabis. And uh, I hadn't realized that it would do me some harm, uh, quite a lot of harm if I kept doing it. Um, I was first admitted to the ward uh, and I was given a sole pride I could, it was brilliant. I could walk into an empty room and there was silence there. Uh, got discharged, then went back on the cannabis, then back into hospital, and the prescription was was increased and changed a bit, you know, uh, sodium valparate, respiridone, um, alanzapine, and now I'm on like lithium and uh, quetiapine, a perfect uh, collection and amounts of, of the precisely the chemicals I need for my brain to function pretty much normally. So since 2010, uh, there has been a life, uh, a life after mental illness, but you have to be careful um, which uh, fields you want to go into, I suppose. So um, I wrote everything down because I had such a, such a creative form of paranoia. Um, there were lots of different things that I'd invented or had been told by voices and things, the person said earlier about voices, um, when they're not telling me to kill myself, that they were like being very uh, uh, cryptic, perhaps, and um, telling me what would happen, what this would happen, that would happen. And I was connected to the world. Whenever I took cannabis, this was the thing. So I would, I would uh, feel bad when I was smoking it, but like less bad than I would be if I wasn't. It's a very strange relationship I have with that. Um, I haven't touched it since 2010. Uh, all these uh, different uh, sort of scenarios and reasons why people do things, like the geographer with my, my, my nemesis, um, I wrote all this down. So in 2012 and finished writing in 2018, uh, the geographer, I'll put the book in the chat if you want, um, The Descent into Madness, uh, 2018. And I was, my, my, my life was getting clearer and more focused over this time. Um, in 2018, I started my first social media account in, in December, uh, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook business all in the same two weeks. It was quite hectic, but I'm glad I did that. And um, February 2019, my first lecture face-to-face uh, -face with Debbie Green at LSBU for OT students there. And since then, I've done about 100 lectures across the country and Northern Ireland, three in America. Um, 
with like all manner of like, amazing uh, healthcare professionals, uh, lecturers and things. And um, there's, there's a, my calendar is filling up quite fast, which is great. I wouldn't have thought this in like, 10, 15 years ago. I would sort of maybe wake up about 11 a.m., do nothing and hope that, you know, nothing happened to me. But now I'm like up at six and like, what's going to happen today? I mean, anything can happen. With, with Dr. DeForti and, um, and, and Robin Murray and just um, going to the cannabis clinics that, that they run, or Marta especially, it's, it's great because we'll have like on the call uh, people on a ward. So they'll be like, uh, you know, that their views on, on cannabis, like legalization, I think it's coming up soon, always different topics and academics from like Jamaica, the Netherlands, um, all over the place, Canada. And um, yes, yeah, so I've been doing all these lectures. And recently, um, as, as a counterpoint to all the, all the different, um, uh, like talk of suicide and depression, and stuff, I've got these two podcasts that I do too. So I've got Ad Gridley's Poetry Cafe and Ad Gridley's Movie Sushi. And every week I post on a Wednesday a different film without any opinion, just like talking you through what's happened. And um, yeah, it's, I, I was lucky really because it wasn't like a group of school friends that I grew up with smoking weed, uh, where the peer pressure would still be there, even if you've, you, you, you've grown up sort of thing. It was all me in a, in a sort of a weirdly good way. Um, I was doing martial arts before I went to Canada and they said, if you keep practicing these, you'll have a hypervigilance. Uh, you won't need to use your, your kicks and that. Then the same week, I read smoke one cannabis joint. If it's good enough, you, you get like super aware and you get psychic. So I went to Canada and this is what I ended up doing. Uh, I wish now I just stick to, just stuck to the martial arts. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was quite a journey. But my, my sort of takeaway phrase would be something like uh, mental health, mental illness isn't always incurable. You know, there there is. I mean, today I was um, lucky enough to lecture for some mental health nurse students uh, in London South Bank. Um, I had to run over here for this, and it's just like they. In any tips I could give, sort of thing, one would be uh, try and try and see the person, the, the patient in front of you, the client. Try and see their future self. You know, when you talk, when you talk to them, when you look to them, and and when you're sort of interacting with them, give them that respect. That, that validation that they they are valued. Uh, this person-centered health thing is is amazing, and and everything comes from them. Uh, once you start respecting someone so much that which everyone's capable of doing, um, that person soon enough will um, respect themselves of their own volition, and they'll carry on and they'll spread that sort of message of hope. I really believe uh, there there is life after mental health uh, problems, definitely. Thank you so much, Adam. That's just hugely inspiring. I'm absolutely exhausted thinking about your pain, <laughs> but it reminds me in a younger era when I used to wake, I used to feel I was one of the luckiest people in the world to wake up every morning and go, right, what, what's going on today? What can we do to kind of uh, make things better today? And it's it's a lovely feeling. I think when you find the, you get the life opportunity to do the kind of work that you, you kind of really feel committed to. Great opportunity. Wow. Where do we follow this up from here? So I, the sense I'm getting, I suppose I'd be quite interested in just other people on the panel's views on what other messages you've got that you would, if you were giving a lecture or you were in your back in your own service, what have you taken away from the, the whole different perspectives we've heard about how can we start expediting a different form of culture in mental health that truly does believe there is life living with and living after mental health. Rob, can I turn to you? Right. I mean, I think everyone has made some incredibly valuable contributions. And I think that the hope that Alison was talking about and the frustration that, that this can't be exported everywhere for everyone. And also Adam, I mean, very honestly talking about how um, using, so I, th I thought you were going to say that you had been given too many drugs by psychiatry. And um, that, and of course that can be the case. And I'm sure there's probably people on the call, on the chat who have experienced that, uh, of psychiatry getting it wrong, of being too reductive in its sort of 
medical optimism and using drugs as if, you know, there's a pill for every ill, that kind of thing. But in your case, it sounds like they did get it right and they did find something that gave you some stability eventually. Um, and also yeah. that quitting cannabis was helpful to you, um, but that it was painful that cannabis helped you as well, but it hurt you more kind of thing. That's what I heard, you know. Mm. Um, so I think that, you know, that there was always this in to psychiatry in the past, there was this thing called the rule of thirds for people with uh, major mental illness or schizophrenia, as it was called, um, that a third of that population get better and never get sick again. A third get better, but sadly get sick again. And a third struggle with chronic um, mental health problems. And I think whether those proportions are, are right or wrong, and you know, there's been lots of studies on that, I think one has to design a mental health system that takes into account those different outcomes, that we should absolutely have optimism and hope throughout the system. We should have roots into normal life, into excelling, into getting PhDs like Zoe, um, wherever you are in the mental health system. But we should also have continuity of care. We should also have the idea that a proportion of the people we meet in mental health services will struggle with chronic mental health problems, significant vulnerabilities, risks of all kinds to themselves, and in some cases, if we're honest, to others, including their families. And that in that context, the mental health system has to be flexible and intelligent enough and work sufficiently well in partnership with other people within the system, including service users and care carers themselves, that it can provide the right care for the right people in the right way. And I think that is something that we've really struggled to do. So what you often have is you can have a very optimistic front end in mental health and a very battered down and pessimistic back end and often under-resourced. And I do, as I was saying earlier, I am optimistic that this shift to integrated care and um, working with partners and, you know, it sounds like a sort of just saying it, but it's made a massive difference having service users and carers in the room, you know, taking part in the management decisions um, of, of how we're going to design services, working with GPs. Remember two thirds to three quarters of people who've had uh, um, uh, an episode of major mental illness like schizophrenia or bipolar one are, are discharged to primary care. So there are significant needs within primary care and GPs are often very unsupported. Um, I mean, Zoe, you were talking about self-harm. I mean, the vast majority of self-harm comes to primary care. So how do we as a system reach out beyond our caseloads in a way that both allows people to get on with their lives recover, get back to life with the, the, the help they need, wherever that comes from, but also be there to support those who are struggling and suffering in whatever way that might be. And Alison talked about the biopsychosocial offer, and I, 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 I would absolutely support that. You know, what does a balanced offer look like um, that, that follows the best evidence we have? Thank you, Rob. I mean, one of the thoughts I've always had is, We've always had that mantra, one third of people have one episode and that's it. One third of people have episodes at times and one third have long term. But that's in a world and a world of research where there hasn't been consistent offering of the evidence based biopsychosocial. So to me, I suppose I, the thing I would turn on end is the, is the expectation that that's right because if we did have a good population offer and we could get it right and we battled and we lobbied and we got the right resources, would it be completely different? Would it be two thirds of people have one or two episodes perhaps and then never have any again? One third of people, despite, uh, you know, I have worked with the most inspiring people I've worked with are service users who live with incredibly difficult long-term mental health conditions and are actually masterminding all sorts of amazing, amazing things. So can we turn the science, the science has given us something, but it was in the context of the, the kind of not being enough there. And Richard, what you, what you listening to this conversation? And um, I hope this hasn't been a conversation that's been uh, with what, what you'd expected since you kindly came from a very different perspective. What's your take on all these interesting, challenging debates we're having. Well, I was very interested um, uh, uh, to listen. Um, I, I work in the NHS, so they're not, they're not completely unfamiliar to me, but um, I think um, uh, sort of seeing uh, a different, um, uh, a 
it's in a different organization a different way of working is is interesting i think um uh, i was um particularly taken i think as an as were a lot of people on the chat about um uh, the lived experience um of uh, both uh, zoe and adam um is something very powerful about um uh, being able to sort of identify with people not necessarily a sort of macroeconomic or sort of macro sort of statistics so i thought that was um a very powerful i guess marrying that somewhat with the the message that i've taken from the school of life is that it's all really quite pointless unless it's in, uh, communicated in an engaging way um, even with people with who are experiencing a sort of severe and enduring mental illness it doesn't mean that they don't want things written properly or presented or branded uh, or, or sort of conveyed in a number of different convenient messages um so i suppose those would be my reflections perhaps on it yeah thank you zoe any anything said that you feel was something that that brought a different thought yeah i think there's a, a, a couple of things if i may i think robert's point about gp i actually wrote that down earlier and it's about the continuity um, so, you know, if, if people are, you know, hopefully going to live well with mental illness, they do get discharged back to primary care or they'll get, um, they'll need to see their primary care physician at some point. And it is about that understanding and experience throughout, you know, the whole of every single profession um, that they, they may encounter. And I think that is, that is a challenge. It's certainly a challenge that I, in the area that I live. Um, I think the other element is about, and it's great, again, what Robert says about having that, you know, the, the service users and family users on that management, it just needs to be across the country. Um, you know, I grew up in the Northeast. Um, most of my inpatient stays were actually in London because of the difficulties around um, being able to have access to services within the Northeast. So I think it, it just needs to be, like you say, Geraldine, everybody needs to be able to access all these psychological therapies and other therapies. Um, and I guess the last thing that I would say is about, in terms of leadership, and it's a, it is again about having this creative idea of leadership within, you know, for the people who are influencing change um, and having these conversations. And people, I suppose, in my, in, in the same position as me, who've had lived experience, certainly know that the people who have influenced my life the most have had lived experience. And I just think that really needs, I feel quite passionately about that, that needs to be really part of the conversation. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I think it was just a fantastic to hear both your stories. And as, as people who've been part of this series and watched this series know, we, we never have a challenging conversation panel that we do not include people with lived experience because it's, it's, uh, I think it's, it's just such a kind of a gap to think that you can have learning without the people. And I think perhaps we've often tried also to have families, um, you know, people, their families, their peer supporters. And I think that's a voice that we'd really like to strengthen in 2022 on our Challenging Conversation series. I mean, we are at a very critical point, I suppose, going forward, because we've got the transformation, the, the national transformation agenda. Um, how can that drive things forward in a different way? Do we think it will mean that even more people are treated in community settings, primary care is helped in a different way? I mean, Ali, you're leading that up in the Northeast. What, what's it feeling like now? I, I think there are some real significant changes taking place, but I, I'm, I'm going to backtrack a little bit and it relates to some of those changes that are taking place and what needs to happen. And I think I talk about culture shift a lot and I see that culture shift changing. And I think one of the key elements of that culture shift is the co-production agenda. And I can see it happening locally and I can see it happening nationally. And when I talk about co-production, I mean, for example, they are really, it is working together with, within organizations. We need a lot more lived experience positions at all levels. And I think that that will change the conversations and change the focus um, from some of those traditional conversations that take place. Uh, 
I, I sometimes see co-production done in a real kind of tokenistic way, and that's not what I'm talking about, involving a couple of people to give their opinion. I mean, really meaningful kind of dialogue and involvement and, and you know, people being employed at an equal level. So in our trust, we have just advertised two lived experience director posts. These are senior management posts, but we'll start to change the conversations within the boardroom. And it, it is that kind of, you know, we need, you know, if we're going to have radical change, then we need to start in terms of those conversations being radically different as well. Not the same people in the same room having the same conversations. So, yeah, I think, you know, it's about partnership and it's about it's yes, when I'm saying co-production, I think lived experience is absolutely essential, but it's also about bringing in other partners. So, you know, primary care, voluntary sector, um, you know, citizens advice, housing, all of those organizations need to be in the room thinking about what are the local needs of the population not fitting people into services but starting with the population and finding out from them what it is they want and i think that that would also change the psychological therapies conversation as well so that's my my view okay adam come back to you sorry what the question please the question really is, off the conversation that we're hearing, is any of it a surprise to you? Is any of it made you think differently about some of the work that you're doing? Anything, any insights that you, you'd like to kind of share from this? Well, I mean, it, it, talking about like medications, is it medications that can help uh, CBT, but more counselling? Uh, for my movie, movie Sushi thing, I, I reviewed, well, I look films, I uh, provide sort of summaries of films so people can relive them. And one was uh, uh, recently A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe playing a schizophrenic maths genius. And the treatments for him in the 70s in America, like insulin shock therapy, like five times a week for 10 weeks. And this is like a pretty a normal psychiatrist was prescribing this. Now, I, I was, and he was, he's trying the new medication because he, he works at Princeton and things. But I mean, I'm thinking, I'm so glad that things have moved forward like that. Um, you don't have to turn up and talk to someone, just take a pill. I mean, I'm amazed. If I had to think of what chemicals are going to help someone think something differently, I know not everyone is behind medications, but for me, it has it, worked for me. And um, yes, I was, I was just thinking, I, I love what I'm hearing generally, you know, just uh, things have to be moved forward and to have lived experience, not just as a hashtag sort of thing, but as, as a central part of um, uh creating uh, modules for courses like for social workers, psych psychiatrists, psychologists, um, nurses, OTs, and, uh, you know, paramedics and, and the police. It's just, it's, it's crucial to, uh, otherwise you're going to jump to conclusions about someone, think they're a threat when they're not a threat. You know, they're, they're, they're acting in a way that you can't explain yourself, but that doesn't mean necessarily they're hostile towards you. Uh, and then there's the way people look on top of that. And there's so many different um, uh, demographics, uh, you know, that, that are flawed, but people will perpetuate these stereotypes. And um, all to, it's all, but for me, to do with um, uh, understanding other people, uh, empathizing with them, staying authentic, but ultimately helping them. That's, gosh, that's, that's a huge recipe for the future. We're having, there's just so much coming in on the chat. I don't think we've ever actually had as much active participation on the chat as we've had for these conversations today. Um, you know, people saying, how, how can we create mental well-being? What can we actually do to prevent mental ill health? How can we build trust? Because some people have had the benefit of fantastic services. Other people have had experiences that have shaped and in some cases, damage them for life. So how can we build trust that things are genuinely changing? And it's one of the reasons we have this open, challenging conversation, because we do, we do want to talk about the things that aren't going well and the things that are going well, because unless we're open about it and we hear different perspectives on it, actually, we won't come up with solutions to it. So the solutions I've heard today are about always, which is my absolute personal, passionate belief, always ensuring that the voice of lived experience is in all the design, debates, delivery, 
review, monitoring of services, always realistically. I, I really love Richard's kind of very way of, in a sense, perhaps telling us to be more thoughtful about not words like recovery, but words like fulfillment, like having a life that's valued. Um, I've certainly loved Zoe's absolute huge honesty about what it's still like working inside services and living in living with mental ill health as a professional inside services. And as always, have just hugely appreciated Rob's fascinating perspective and 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 real commitment to work in alliances with others. Um, and Ali's continual shaking, shaking the gates of things that aren't going right and saying we really, really got to do better. We could go on talking for the next hour, but we've only got four minutes left. Could I just get one, one, just one quick reflection from each of you about today? One take home message uh, you'd like to give. And you don't feel you have to, but is there a message you really want to get across that you haven't been able to so far? Adam? I was going to say something I already said. Uh, mental illness isn't always incurable. Great. Richard? Uh, I think just that there is um, hope that comes from the possibility of a meaningful life, even if it's sometimes difficult. Thank you. Ali? Oh, <laughs> uh, something meaningful. I, I think what is great is when we have these panel conversations and you appreciate that there are allies out there. You know, you look at the chat. There are a lot of people who are really pushing for change. We need to work together and we need to ha make that change happen. Within and with outside systems. Yeah. Rob? Yeah, I mean, I think what I've taken from today is the enormous diversity of experience. And it's been fascinating reading the chat as we go along. I think um, I would agree with you, Geraldine. We mustn't be uh, constrained by old scientific sort of shibboleths that, you know, only a third can blah, blah, blah. So obviously not. But equally, I think we have to uh, um, be, be sort of accepting of the wide variety of outcomes and the ways that people suffer. And so both be a system as a whole that can provide hope and opportunity, but also provide continuity of care and be there for the most vulnerable and those who suffer most chronically. So I think it's having both of those things would be what I would want to fight for. Fantastic. And I did, I wanted Zoe to have the last word. Zoe, as one of our digital fellows working <laughs> inside now, helping us create this series and working up in Tzesk and we're, we're both you and Ali, Ali work. Yeah. Um, What's your last word before we close down today? So I would say that um, I think it's great that we are, again, like Ali says, having these conversations. Um, and I also think that we also just need to look at the individual and we need to work in systems and create systems where the individual is not expected to fit the system, that the system will work creatively to meet the needs of the individual, to support them so that they can live whatever fulfilling life that, and whatever that looks like for them. You have been amazing panelists. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the audience. And my very sincere apologies that it's really hard to answer things on the chat as well. We will take away what you've put on the chat and we would love to come back to you and ask you, how can we design more of these sessions where your voice in from the chat can be heard and the issues that you bring up about the need for openness and honesty, the need to involve families more, the need to actually listen and learn from what has gone well, and but also what has not gone well, what have been tragedies, what have been glow, glowing successes. And we need to work together because if we don't work together, we won't get all the best brains and all the best heart on the case of this. But I, I take away from today, like everybody on the panel, a real sense of hope and optimism that we're in a different place going forward. So thank you so much indeed for participating and thank you for listening. Take care all, bye.